Hello and welcome to Open the Bible. My name is Reverend Amanda Bedra. I am in Exodus 32 today. I am so excited. It is such a phenomenal part of scripture. Today, I am talking about lead like Moses, because in this chapter, there are some key lessons that we can learn about how to be better leaders and whether that's leading yourself, whether that's leading a small group, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's even leading a large church or a community. There are some lessons that we can learn um, from Moses in terms of how to lead and how to lead successfully. So Exodus 32, I'll give you a quick summary. It's a long portion of scripture. I encourage you to read it for yourself. It's really interesting. It's power packed. Um, but let me do a quick summary for you and then we'll jump right into the lessons. So this is the time where the Israelites have successfully been brought out of Egypt. Now they are um, in the wilderness and Moses has gone up the mountain to have a conversation with God. This is where Moses is on the mountain. He's, you know, taking down the Ten Commandments, he's communing with God. And we see in the beginning of the chapter, the Israelites go to Aaron, um, who is Moses' brother, as we know. And Aaron has been left in charge of these people that God has given them to um, to lead. So they go to Aaron and they say to him, we don't know what's happening with Moses. You know, this guy, he's been up there for so long. We don't even know if he's coming back. You need to build us um, something that we can worship, create something that we can worship. So this is what they say to Aaron. Now, Aaron listens to the people and he says to them, bring your jewelry, your earrings, your bracelets, everything that you have. And they put it together into this fire. And out of the fire comes this golden calf. And the people get so excited, they start to worship the calf. And they have the audacity to be worshipping this idol. And they even say, this idol brought us out of Egypt. Now, God is looking at these people and he's thinking, what is going on? So he says to Moses, look, look at your people. Look at what they're doing. In fact, I'm so angry with them. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to make you into a nation. So Moses says to God, you know, calm down, please. Please don't do this thing that you're saying that you're going to do. Remember who you are and remember what you've promised. And so God says, okay, fine, I'm not going to kill them all, but you need to go down and you need to sort these people out. Now, I believe that at this time where Moses is having this conversation with God, he doesn't know what they are doing. He doesn't, he doesn't see the magnitude of what these people are doing. So Moses comes down from the mountain and he starts to hear this loud noise. Now he's having this conversation with Joshua and he's like, this doesn't sound like it's it's a noise of, of, of victory, of war. This doesn't sound like, you know, this is like a battle cry. This sounds like singing. And as he goes closer, he sees these people, they're dancing, they're worshipping this false idol. They're talking all kinds of rubbish. And Moses gets so angry. He has the tablets where he's written the Ten Commandments on and he drops them and they break. And he's like, Aaron, how have you let this happen? How did you get to this point? Why did you let the people do this to you? And Aaron says, well, you know how these people are. They're sinful people and they, you know, they pressured me, they pushed me and all of that. And so Moses says, okay, we need to do something about this. And he says, who's for the Lord? Now the tribe of Levites, um, Levites put their hands up and they say, look, we're for the Lord. And they do a cleansing exercise. So a few people die, something like 3,000 people um, are cleansed from, um, from the midst of the Israelites. And Moses says, this thing that you've done is such a great sin. I need to go back to God and ask God to forgive you. And so Moses goes back to God. And I, I will read a portion of scripture, um, 32, 32, actually. And this is Moses. He's saying to God, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book of life, which you have written. So God forgives them. But of course, there are consequences. And so he sends a plague. So this is the gist of Exodus 32. Now, I love this portion of scripture because there's some things that we can learn. The first thing that I want to draw out of this story is the, the contrast between Aaron as a leader and Moses as a leader. What we see is that Aaron is the leader that wants to please people. So he's listening to the people. He's being led by the people. And what we see in Moses is that he's a leader that wants to please God. So that's the first lesson. When you start to think, when you start to think about leadership, you have to be a leader that is committed to pleasing God. That, the, you know, the things that God has asked you to do, 
takes priority above everything else that you're not people pleasing you're not taking into consideration you know what people want that your first priority is always is this the will of god what has god said what does god expect that when we are people that are going to either lead ourselves or lead others we are leading from a godly perspective and we're not leading from a manly perspective Aaron was listening to the people. Moses was listening to God. And so we get to choose what kind of leaders are we going to be? Are we going to be leaders that listen to people or are we going to be leaders that listen to God? And as you can see, one of them chose the right path. So that's my first encouragement for you, that you are not like Aaron that would say, the people pressured me, the people controlled me, that you are not led by what people say. But instead, you remember to always put God first. The second thing that I see in this part of scripture is that we all, me, you, everybody, we've been created with an inherent need to worship. We all have. That is the way that God made us. God made us with a desire to worship. But the question is, what are we going to worship? Are we worshiping God or are we building false idols? These people had gotten to the point where they said, we need something. We need something to worship because that's how we've been designed. But unfortunately, they were choosing to worship the wrong thing. And sometimes we, we, we I mean, we can read the story and think, oh, well, this is not me. I only worship God. But this plays out in different ways. When you are impatient and you choose to bring something to replace God, that is idol worshiping. And sometimes we are waiting on God for, for something that we've prayed for. We are waiting on God to answer a particular situation. And when we get tired of waiting, we start to make wrong choices because when we try to replace God, it will cost us something. Think about it. The Israelites had been given um, a lot of gold. As they were leaving Egypt, the Egyptians were giving them their gold. They were giving them earrings, bracelets. Now they have taken all those things that were given to them as gifts and despised it and used it to make a false idol. So idol worshipping, false idol worshipping will always cost you something. You would always make a mistake when you try to replace God. When you get to that point of impatience and you think, I'm going to do something else. We see it in the Bible with Sarah. God had given her a promise, but instead of waiting, there comes Ishmael. And we see all the problems that come out of that. And there are so many other examples in the Bible where out of impatience, people make wrong choices. And maybe that is something that you can relate to today, that instead of waiting on God for something, you've chosen to do something else. It always comes at a cost. So as leaders, we want to be the kind of leaders that would always encourage people to wait. When people come and they say to you, God is taking too long, be the kind of leader that says, be patient with God. Take your time with this. Don't go and look to the left or look to the right. Don't go and try to replace God. Be the kind of leader that encourages people to wait. The Israelites said, we don't know what's happening with Moses. He's taking too much time. And so give us something else. But it was a wrong move. And as we can see, it came with very painful and very costly consequences. The third thing that we see from this part of scripture is as a leader, we have to have love and compassion for the people that God has entrusted us with. Earlier, I read um, verse 32 from chapter 32. I really love that part of scripture because it shows us something significant. This is Moses saying to God, You've entrusted me with these people. I'm asking for forgiveness on their behalf. But if you think their sin is too great, then count me as one of the transgressors. Blot my name out. And I read this part of scripture and it challenges me because it makes me ask myself, am I that kind of leader that has such love and compassion for the people that God has entrusted me with, whether that's my children, whether that's the community, whether that's the church I serve, am I the kind of leader that is willing to say to God, count me as one of the transgressions. Don't, um, don't, don't leave me out from their punishment, but I'm bringing them to you and asking you to forgive them. And also, when God said to Moses, um, let me look for the particular verse. So this is 32 verse 10. Now this is God speaking to Moses and he says, Now leave me alone 
so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. We see that Moses did not um, accept this opportunity to become a great nation and say to God, yes, God, you know, wipe them all out. Make me a great nation. So that tells me that he was also a leader that was not self-seeking. He wasn't looking after his own interest. He wasn't looking to make his name great. He was looking to do what God had asked him to do, which was to lead the people to the promised land, regardless of the cost. And so he said to God, God, remember what you had said and remember who you are. So the third thing is, you know, lead with love, lead with, lead with compassion. Don't be self-seeking. Don't think about your own interests. Don't think about making a nation for yourself and forget the people that God has entrusted you to. But instead, we can go to the fourth lesson, which is to remind God of who he is. Moses put God in remembrance of his integrity. He said to God, don't allow the Egyptians say that you were not powerful enough to lead these people out of the wilderness, so you killed them. And today we can go back to God. And it's one of the things that I personally, I say to God all the time. I say, God, don't ever put me in a situation where people will say, I thought you serve a God. Don't ever put me in a situation where people would question the God that I serve, the relationship that I have with you, whether you're almighty or you're all powerful. God, bring me to a place where people can look at my life and they can see the evidence of you. That I have a light that shines so bright that people turn to you in praise because you are doing magnificent, magnificent things in my life. And so I encourage you, even as a leader, to put God in remembrance of his integrity. And you can go to God and you can say, on behalf of my children, on behalf of my church, on behalf of my community, whoever it is you're leading, or even on behalf of myself, because we are called to be self-leaders, that you say to God, remember who you are concerning me. Put God in remembrance of your integrity. The fifth thing is that Moses put God in remembrance of his word. He had already given a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And this is Moses saying to God, Moses said to God, um, turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on this on your people. This is the end of verse 12. And then verse 13, he says, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as great as the sky. And I will give your descendants all this land, I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Moses reminded God about what he said. As leaders, we need to be able to remind God about what he said. But before we can remind God about what he said, we actually need to know what God said. So we have a responsibility to take the time to study the word, to look for the promises of God concerning our situation. If you are um, listening to this and you're a mother, what has God said concerning your children? What are the promises in the Bible that you can stand on? You know, when I start to see certain things going, I've got three kids and I start to see them behaving in, in, in some kind of way. One of the scriptures that I go back to God with is, Father, you said all my children will be taught by you and great will be their peace. So whatever it is I'm looking at right now doesn't look like what you've said. So I am putting God in remembrance of his word and I'm saying all my children shall be taught by the Lord and great will be the peace of my children. I remind God that my children are made for signs and wonders. I remind God that he's got good plans, not just for me, but for my children. And it gives me the confidence because I know that when God speaks, his word does not come back for it. And when he says a thing, it comes to pass. And do you know, actually, the only language the devil really understands is it is written. So we need to know what is written. And we can go back to God and not just remind him of who he is. We have to remind him of what he said. Not because he has forgotten, but because he, we, we know what he has said. And it becomes a solid foundation that we can stand on. And so as leaders, I encourage you. Know what it is God has said. And we see the evidence of it because, because Moses reminded God who he was and God, Moses reminded God what he said. God relented. 
in the plans that he had. So those are some of the key lessons that we can learn from Exodus 32. As I said earlier, I encourage you, read it for yourself. And perhaps God will say something else to you. And whilst you're reading it, you will see something else that jumps out at you. But remember to lead like Moses and not lead like Aaron. In this particular chapter, we see that Aaron was leading out of, um, out of the desires of man. And Moses is leading out of the desires of God. And we also see that we all have an inherent need to worship. So the question is, what are you worshiping? What are you trying to replace God with? Because when you remove God and you replace it with something else, it will come at a huge cost. It will cost you something that could have lasted for generations. It's always costly and it always leads to negative consequences. We see Moses leading with love and with compassion to the extent that he's willing to lay his life down for the people that God has called him to serve. We also see Moses leading, you know, by reminding God of who he is, putting God in remembrance of his integrity. And we see Moses reminding God of what he has said, what he has promised. And it's so important that as leaders, we know these things so that when we go back to God in prayer, whether we're praying for ourselves because we're called to lead ourselves as well as lead others, that we can put God in remembrance of his word. We can put God in remembrance of integrity, that we can lead from a place of love and compassion, that we can lead from a place of knowing um, that God is the one that we ultimately serve and we put him first and we always make him priority that he's the one that we worship and that we are not people pleasing we are not man pleasing and we're not turning towards the desires of man but we are constantly turning towards the desires of God now I'm not saying that this is an exhaustive list but I'm saying from Exodus 32 these are some of the key lessons that we can learn that can help us on our journey to becoming better leaders I hope it has blessed you and I know that there's somebody in your world that needs to hear this message. So I encourage you, share it with someone, talk to someone about it, read Exodus 32 for yourself, meditate on the word, remember to find out what the promises of God are and you know have them written down because that is the language that the devil understands and I pray that you are continually blessed. And I also want to say, perhaps you're listening to this message and you, you see yourself in Exodus 32 like the Israelites where you have replaced God. Or you see yourself in a situation where you have um, made decisions that please man but don't necessarily please God. There is room for restoration. There is room for repentance. There is room for redemption. We serve an almighty God who loves to redeem, to restore, and to save his children. And so I encourage you to go to your father today in prayer and simply say, God, I'm sorry. I've made a mistake. Help me to turn my life around and give me the courage and the wisdom and the discernment and everything that I need to be able to lead like Moses. Until next time, stay blessed. It has been a huge privilege and an honor to be able to bring this word to you today. And I look forward to sharing with you from the word of God in the nearest future. Take care now. Have a good evening. Bye.